Hi, I'm Dr. Melanie. I'm thrilled to introduce my next expert guest, a figure often called a legend by many in the dog training community. My friend Michael Ellis is not just an internationally acclaimed dog trainer and educator with over 30 years of expertise, but he's also a beacon of innovation and progress. His teaching spans a diverse group from competitive sports trainers to law enforcement to pet dog trainers and owners around the world. More than just his accomplishments, Michael is known for his approachability, always meeting everyone with kindness, curiosity, and patience. His dog handling is a masterful blend of empathy and confidence, infused with finesse and an undeniable element of fun. Over the course of more than three hours and two days, Michael and I delved deep into a topic both of us are passionate about, merging neuroscience with practical hands-on training. It was a stimulating and inspiring conversation, and I can't wait for you all to hear it. Enjoy. I think the majority of, of well, my audience for sure already knows who you are, and I'm not going to ask you, how did you start with dog training? But for those who do not know you, here's one question. What yeah. are three things you think everyone should know about you or what are three things that if one knows them about you they have a pretty good idea who michael alice is wow an easy question right off the bat <laughs> well I, I think one is that um i'm a reluctant professional dog trainer so it's one of those things that i uh, converted my hobby or my passion into uh, an accidental career and so uh, my path through the dog training world has been a little uh non-traditional in the sense that I, I kind of didn't do a lot of planning. Uh, I, I sort of just uh, did what was in front of me <laughs> and, and let it have a life of its own. So I've had a kind of organic career in dog training. And, I, and so now in my, uh, uh, as I approach retirement age and I think about uh, uh, slowing down and having to make plans, uh, that's totally not my jam. So <laughs> very good at that part of it. <laughs> very good. Planning my dog training, not so good at planning my life. <laughs> That's one of the things. But I think that it's been to some degree useful because I didn't put a lot of pressure on myself to to be something uh, or have build a business to a certain point or have a bunch of employees or sell myself in a certain way. And I just kind of let the, the work speak for itself a, a bit and see where it goes. I kind of feel that way about dog training. So if you know that about me, then that probably gives you an idea about how I feel about the organic nature of dog training, that kind of each dog that's in front of you, you have to let it unfold uh, at their pace, kind of, uh, keeping in mind some larger ideas and principles and not um, try to force things to happen in a certain time frame or a certain way because economics or some other dog you had did it like that. So. Uh, the, I think the way I've moved through my life is the way that uh, I would prefer people train dogs to, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do remember you telling me or us to not overthink it and mm -hmm. start having more fun and these things. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Like, And so for me, that's I always go back to that touchstone of the fact that I started in this because I was astonished at what dogs were capable of and mm -hmm. I came into dog training uh, 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 through sport and that world and so keeping that kind of sense of wonder about the whole process and reminding yourself that it's supposed to be fun for you and the dog I mean I think we get to this point where we want to turn the dog into something sometimes that it's not or something that fits our life more functionally and we can lose sight of some of that stuff so uh. when you say it's been an accidental career mm. and I think a lot of people are glad that this happened accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> That's very um, kind. What would have been the non-accidental career? I would have definitely gone into, into environmental policy, resource conservation, that sort of thing. I have a undergraduate degree in biogeography. I was super into, um, mm. into geography, um, evolutionary theory and, and, uh, uh, and probably uh, environmental policy was where I was headed. So <clears throat> at the time when this sort of took off, I was contemplating grad school and that sort of thing. So that was the, the direction. Now I'm, I'm kind of glad that it didn't go that way in the sense that most of the stuff that 
I did in undergrad now is all uh, computer geographic information systems. So most of the ge geographers are um, computer scientists now, which is <laughs> definitely not my jam. I had this romantic notion of, you know, being outside and like an old timey naturalist and <laughs> convincing people to save the, save the planet, that kind of thing. That's, I would have been something along those lines. <laughs> when I, when I started um, going to college and even that for me also feels like ages ago, um, and it was back in my hometown, Jena, which is a pretty small town in Germany and it's, you know, a lot of nature. So I went to, to college for biology and I remember what my classes looked like is, you know, getting up, and you will you will appreciate that getting up at 5 a.m and then going to track birds and try to understand and well i never got into it because for me it's like they sound all the same <laughs> but also going with the net through the grass and like catching all the animals and insects yes. that's how i basically started with you know yes that's, that's exactly what i would be thrilled to death to do that <laughs> every morning and go catch bugs and look at them <laughs> and take notes and i'd be thrilled with that it would be no problem <laughs> you obviously stayed in the dog training business um and you said to yourself, you're glad that you did for various reasons, I suppose. But what is it that keeps you passionate in that field? What is it about interacting with dogs that, you know, warms your heart, yeah. makes you feel passionate about it? The dog part's the easy part for me. So for sure, the um, watching a dog learn new stuff. And each time I start a new, I'm starting a new puppy right now. And each time I go through that process, um, I'm endlessly fascinated. That's super cool to be a part of, to have that relationship with another species and watch what they're capable of and watch them blossom and all those connections. I, I, I still don't get tired of that. Like I, mm -hmm. that I enjoy what has m helped me make a career of dog training is the fact that I got kind of excited about teaching relatively mm -hmm. early on when I started doing seminars and I realized quickly that, you know, the job was a teacher. The subject was dog training, but it was much more about the people and interacting with the people and helping them get better and see things potentially from a different perspective and through that potentially affect change on a lot of people and a lot of dogs' lives. And so when I realized that, I had not set out to be a teacher. I, you know, in that sense. But once I realized that was the job, I got kind of fascinated with that. And still that's um, very gratifying to be able to go in and communicate to people in a way that they understand and help them make this. It's the same way that it's gratifying to teach a dog and watch those, watch mm -hmm. them make those big leaps and those connections and those aha moments that dogs have in the training process. You get to have that with people too. So yeah. once I embrace that, then that, you're, you're again, never bored, right? You're going to encounter someone that has limitations from the way you would normally do things. And so now you've got to figure out, okay, the way I would normally do this isn't going to suit this person. How can we, how can we take the principles we know about training and modify them to suit that person? So no matter how long you do it, I, I would add, honestly, it's a cliche, but the longer you do it, the, the, the less, you know, in, in a sense, yeah. you concretely know, um, mm -hmm. And so you, the deeper you get into any subject, the the more fascinating it is and the more you're yeah. like, oh, I never thought of that. And I never thought of that. I hear you. You can yeah, totally yeah. go down a rabbit hole of certain things. I'm currently maybe not surprising me because you've heard me be obsessed with the play thing. <laughs> so oh, so yeah. Long, but yes. I went down a very, very, very deep, 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 deep rabbit hole of play and the neurobiology of play. Do you like going to conferences? I do. Yeah, I really do. Uh, so personally, um, I'm one of those people. I am a super amateur scientist in the sense that I'm not con very rigorous about any of that. But I've always been intensely fascinated with why things work. Right? Mm -hmm. So anytime there's something that you know through experience, through feel, like let's take play as an example. Like when I learn to play with dogs, I was certainly wasn't thinking about the science of it. I wasn't thinking about neurobiology. I wasn't thinking about any of that, right? Just trying to get a dog to do something and like chase the damn ball, please, or whatever it was going to be, right? And you work through that. And then over time, you gain, gain kind of practical hands-on experience and you begin to recognize ways to manipulate the dog. And then when something comes along scientifically and tells you why something works 
in a certain case or what's going on um, beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. That is endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, that's so cool, I, the, the, right? You know that through experience, but you don't know it through through the science end of it. So I love that yeah. kind of thing anytime it happens. You know, for me, it's 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 a little bit the opposite, right? Because I come you're, more from you're a, you're a real scientist, <laughs> and I am like, okay, this is how it should be, and oftentimes, more often than that, it's not what it is in reality on like an impractical yes. um, sense. But then when it does match, um, it's it's so fascinating, right? Because you kind of put pieces together. And then you push forward to to create something new that maybe hasn't been done before. And I think I that is the part that, that is to me super, super exciting about dog training. Obviously, you know, working with animals of different species has its own charm, mm -hmm. but it can be super nerdy. And uh, there's so many <laughs> open questions still about yeah. you know, dogs and, and you, human bond living in, in today's society. And also many heartwarming and mind blowing stories about what dogs can do, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. So yes. I, want to, I want to move a little bit to the, the current landscape of dog training. Ever since you had, have started teaching, educating, training dogs, what has been the biggest change that you've seen? And given now, what is it, October 6, 2023, what is the biggest uh, challenge currently that you see in the, in the dog training landscape? Wow, that's a good question. So um, I am uh, lucky. I don't even know that's the right word to have a career now. I started dog training 45 years ago, I guess, mm -hmm. so 45 years ago. And so I have a, a, a career that sort of spans a lot of the modern changes. So I think for a long time, probably pre-1980, for 50 years before that, there weren't a whole lot of changes in dog training. Yeah. Right. So it basically, it was pretty much traditional, compulsory, escape and avoidance based type training, right? And that's what I learned when I started, for sure. So I got to be there for what I call the reward based revolution. So in the late 80s, when marine mammal trainers, etc, started doing seminars, exotic animal trainers started doing seminars for dog trainers, uh, you know, clicker work started to come in the whole movement of uh, positive reinforcement and kind of understanding operant conditioning in a, in a way and using rewards uh, in dog training. Uh, I was there for sort of the beginning of that, at least in a mass sense. And so had to switch gears and adopt those and explore that world. I say all the time that when I first started giving seminars, I did a lot of going around to dog training clubs uh, talking to traditional trainers, teaching them how to use rewards early on. Um, and then I was that we got to kind of watch the whole swing of the pendulum, if you want, right? Mm -hmm. Where people uh, began to lean more and more heavily into the idea of positive reinforcement and negative punishment, and uh, avoiding the use of aversives in, in dog training, and this idea, the force free community idea, um, got stronger and stronger in a sense to the point where, in, in my opinion, and we all talked about this at various times that we've overcorrected to some degree and taking tools off the table that that um are a potential disservice to the dogs right that's it's not not only is it not practical in the real world uh, for a wide variety of dogs but also i would honestly say that it um it does not prepare the dog for stress in a way that's appropriate and so there's a lot of things about uh, purely positive or uh, force-free community that have swung too much the other way. Mm -hmm. And so then I got to start to go to clubs and say, oh, hey, by the way, all you guys that are getting very good at using rewards, it's okay to say no to your dog. It's okay to make your dog do something every once in a while, right? And and so, uh, and it feel like I was trying to pull it back the other way. And I wound up teaching a whole bunch of force-free trainers how to give a correction or how to use an electronic collar or something like that. The idea of science coming into dog training early on, most of the science around dog training was science that was geared towards human or primate biology in some fashion. Like we're doing experiments on animals to understand learning or whatever that is, but we don't care about dogs. We don't care about being better dog trainers or any of that. It was humans gathering information for humans that would suit them. And now one of the cool things about the modern scientific landscape is they're actually doing dog science to benefit dogs <laughs> and to benefit dog trainers, which is kind of amazing and cool. So that all that 
came in early on. I, there was nobody giving me any kind of science. When I first started dog training, it was 100% like, do this, you get this. You see this, do this. You see this, do that. But no discussions of why or any of that. So that whole landscape, I have been along for the entire ride, which has been pretty cool, right? In, in that whole process and changes in attitudes in, uh, in culturally around training that whole thing. I think now our biggest challenges are finding um, what I would call truly balanced training, finding the sweet spot for every individual dog in terms of how much is done with the giving and withholding of rewards, how much pressure is necessary, where should it come in, what does a well-constructed program look like? And without spending too much time on this, there's there's a lot of people that, in my opinion, misuse the balanced trainer moniker, right? So balanced training was is meant to be people trying to find the best path forward, keeping all of our options open for a given dog in a given situation. And there were lots and lots of people that were very traditional kind of heavy compulsory trainers that called themselves balanced training and they did a little bit of food work for two days and then they put an e-collar on the dog. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't necessarily call that balanced, right? But I think the best dog training right now is truly seeking a balance there and is also seeking uh, an understanding of why certain things work, don't work. Uh, and then there's a point where this, we're merging science and practice in a way that we that hasn't happened up until now, which is exciting. It is, it is. And and one thing that, some things that also have changed, um, not just for dog training ever since you started, but it is, you know, how, how we distribute information. Mm -hmm. and the sheer amount of information that is out there and what you do with this as the owner or even a, a trainer and, you know, content creation. I mean, you're creating content just right now, right? <laughs> right. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> it's a... um, and and do you think that because of this there are, there's benefits and, and disadvantages or advantages and disadvantages but also kind of fostering some level of of easy judgment based on what you know you think you know or mm. you know what you've heard in the past is this potentially blocking the progress because the way you phrase it what i hear is it's not so much of um so we had the the big bad what is called bad dog training um very aversive dog training in the past then we swung to the other extreme which is uh, pure positive only and instead of maybe seeing it as going back more where it was before it's kind of like taking from both sides what we can learn and actually mm -hmm. move forward right yes. but it would mean that there is some sort of unification and we get united and actually have the same goal and i think the judgment that is being placed on owners by owners, by other trainers, m among trainers, right? It's, it's very hard to fight and can really block you from progressing or having some creative idea about new things. So yes. you can have to be very confident in who you are and what you do. Um, so two questions here, basically, what, how do you handle this? And I'm sure you've seen and come across a lot of judgment towards yourself, your training methods, have seen others that you've trained. and. How do you handle that? So uh, if you touched on a couple of things in there, which I think are super important, right? So you're right. There's ac more access to information than ever before. Almost too much to a, se a sense for somebody that's starting out. Like, what direction do I go? It's really easy to get overwhelmed. And it's also really easy to develop, uh, way easier than it ever has been to develop a theoretical fluency with training. Meaning I can go on the internet and follow good trainers and parrot or mimic what they do or regurgitate answers that I heard to questions about training, et cetera. And someone that's smart and motivated can relatively quickly seem like they know more than they actually know. So I'm making a distinction between like theoretical knowledge and practical hands-on knowledge where you've actually been through the entire process with a number of dogs a variety of different types of dogs and you've gone from beginning to end and you've had your hands on the whole thing and there's a different kind of knowing that comes from that right and so at one point it's great in that people can get access to all of this stuff relatively quickly and another point that it's not any easier to get the practical experience than it ever has been and be in everything seems to be going so fast i think a lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves 
to look a certain way, to know certain things. And you're being watched all the time in a way that mm -hmm. when I came up, you were not at all. You'd go to a seminar, like after you left the seminar and we all went back to our own corners and goofed around with it, whatever we learned for the next six months or a year, <laughs> not being watched by the internet, not having it posted everything we do going up online and not feeling in any way judged by it, right? You weren't, you, so it gave you the freedom to, to mess around with it and, and find out where it fits and test the limits of it and all those things that are, I think, essential to really understand something. And so the fact that we're doing everything in, in, in front of everybody all the time is a little bit problematic. The way I handle it, luckily, I had developed um, some reputation before it got out of hand like it is now. <laughs> like everyone, it's the reality it is. I, I got to stop sounding like an old man. Like, ah, geez. <laughs> He's a, the truth is it's it's the way the world's going and it's all it's all fine but i had developed a reputation so i had some confidence in what i was doing wow. and then i really learned very early on around the internet not to pay any attention to it so before social media there were dog training chat rooms and all those kinds of things where people would go in and and i went into those a couple of times thinking oh cool this is going to be a dog training discussion and i'm like oh no that's not what it is it's just people wanting to like be mean to each other kind mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. i'm like okay i don't need that in my life and so i try not to pay too much attention to any of it the good the bad or any of it so people saying a lot of nice things about you lovely but also probably not perfectly accurate and people saying all the horrible stuff about you and judging you also. So I just try not to pay any attention to it. Right. Um, and then I, I think you have to, um, get over the, um, the fear of looking bad or failing in front of people. Right. Cause everything's recorded now in a sense that, and everybody to get better, you have to fail. There's just, no way about it. No, no, no shortcuts around it. You're going to have to go out there and you're going to have to try it and it's not going to go the way you want it to go. And whether it's a competition or whether it's just training in general and the sooner you can just say, yep, like anybody can choke at any time. And it's, it's, it, it's not, you're going to do that and you're going to have to be okay doing it in front of people, the better off you're going to be. I choose to compete in a sport that, um, is challenging enough that no matter how good you are at it, you can fail on any given day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, can have, you can be the best Mondial ring trainer in the world. You can have a really well prepared dog. And based on how that day is set up, you could tank completely. And I find that th that's a, it's a good thing for you in a sense, once you've accepted that, then there's a freedom that comes with that. And you can just focus on the training instead of, what it's going to look like to have people say bad things about you because oh look this professional trainer failed like why would i take advice from them and mm -hmm. that is fear for a lot of people now yeah. the sooner you can get over that the better obviously we don't want to get stuck in uh, a society you don't want to get stuck in, in this judgment and i think too many people love their dogs too much that we can agree we kind of want to you know not standing still in any sense of the world we want to progress and move forward right. and create new new things uh from your perspective because i'm obviously biased but what role do you think science could or should play in that movement forward i think i, I think it should it should it can and should uh play a supporting role right so one it should be like any good science should be it should be trying to get to the truth of it not trying to support an idea right and so unfortunately i think a lot of the early studies or the the, the studies in the last decade or 15 years a lot of them were kind of constructed with a fair amount of bias to prove a point to begin with and so i think the role science can have is as a way of an impartial view of a lot of things that we think we know right and so there's a practical aspect of training and experienced trainers will say hey i know that this will work right in a sense and i know that when we run up against this this doesn't work for this type of dog or whatever that is um, science can help us understand why and maybe predict those situations sooner 
So we're not trying to put the wrong dog through the wrong kind of training program. It has a lot of potential for that. It also has a lot of potential for um, helping with public policy and things like that if it's done con constructed well. Mm -hmm. Now we are facing uh, potential bans on certain types of training tools or certain types of training. And there's a lot of emotion around that and not a lot of well-constructed hard science geared towards finding out the truth, not yeah. not supporting a, a, a conclusion that somebody's already got, right? Yeah. And so, so to me, that's that that's the, the, the possibility for science, right? And then also I think there's the underlying thing that for just like with dogs have a certain learning style, so do human beings. And there you'll have people who um, aren't connecting with something until they know why, right? So I can train one student and say, don't worry about why, just do this. And they're perfectly happy with that. They're like, cool, that works. That's all I really wanted to know anyway. I just wanted them to be able to solve this problem. I don't really care why or how or what's going on <laughs> in the dog's neurobiology. I just want to be able to stop this, right? Or, or fix this or make my dog do that. And I, But there are other people that can't commit to certain ideas unless they know why. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody that goes like, yeah, you're telling me that, but I am, how am I, how am I supposed to know that for sure? And what, like, show me, like, why does that work? Can you explain to me what, how that works? Right. And yeah, I, the, the those of why is why. All, why, why. all the time. Right. And so science can, can help with that. Yeah. And allow somebody to commit to an idea. Right. If they, if they say, okay, there's research that says this is the right path, then okay, I can commit to that path. Yeah. If there's not evidence, then maybe I don't want to commit to that path and potentially do damage to my dog. So it could play that role as well. I think that's that's the the type of learning that I that I do or prefer. I need I I'm not surprised. Really hard. <laughs> I have a very hard time committing unless unless I at least a little bit know know why. Um mm -hmm. and uh one of my uh, supervisors back at, at Kalmar University, he was saying that, you know, to be really, really a good researcher, or really like with anything that you do, um, to, to keep your ego in check and to make sure you're not going down the wrong path, you kind of want to try to always prove yourself wrong because that makes you have an open mind to new things. Because, you know, we kind of pick, and especially when it comes to scientific publications, we pick one publication that kind of supports our very own personal point of view and then we go out and say well science has shown and it's just not enough nowadays particularly to just have one type of one publication to prove anything yeah, but it's, if you can prove yourself wrong then you might actually be closer to finding the truth yeah uh, that makes perfect sense to me right and uh, and as soon as you've decided then it's difficult to grow and so that idea that you're going to continue to question something that you've accepted as true potentially even or incorporated it into your training repertoire as true doesn't mean that you don't take second looks at it and this cuts both ways right so as we progress there tends a, tends to be a tendency to toss out older techniques and ideas as um, outdated or no longer relevant and that's not the case right so just because it uh, uh, we knew it a hundred years ago doesn't mean that it's any less true necessarily. And so sometimes we have a we have the tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater as we move forward and go like, oh, that's passe. Like that study was 30 years old, so it can't be telling us anything. Like, ah, careful. Yeah. And it's the same with training techniques. I find yeah. that um, you, at, having watched all the training methodologies change, you get people that are coming into training at different times. And you can see the people that are stuck with what they learned and are unable to adapt outside of that. Whether it was traditional trainers who were unable to incorporate the reward-based ideas, or now it's reward-based trainers that are unable to see the value in some of the more traditional training methodologies yeah. who still have value. And then they're the people that are constantly trying to prove themselves wrong in a sense. And they're trying to figure out like, I have this, uh, this is the way I think it is. Is it really? Is it really? Don't don't get stuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Um, it gives me that, that reminds me of an example. <laughs> and this is me coming back to play. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can talk about play all you like. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, well, I, my husband's ears are also bleeding because <laughs> I'm telling him all the studies that I'm reading since the '60s. '60s. So what? 60 years ago, we yeah. knew that chimpanzees and that and that study, even if hungry, even if 
uh, presented with a palatable food mm -hmm. prefer to play than to take the food. And that hasn't changed. We just have not really incorporated what has been done back then into how we look at these things now. Yes. You need to make a giant billboard of that and plaster it all over the dog training world, right? <laughs> you, it, it, there's so many implications to that, like especially with the reward-based kind of force-free kind of thing now, relying so heavily on food stuff, right? And there's not a lot of discussion in behavior modification, in companion dog training, or any of those things, and not as much as there should be about play, right? And then also that help would easily helps you understand the the conflicts between play and food um, in training sessions together, you know, mm -hmm. where people are trying to use both and, and where one type of reinforcement strongly overshadows the other. Uh, and that all makes perfect sense to me, right? If you had every type of equipment, material, money, if you will, help, you can possibly imagine from the dogs um, to research lab to, I don't know, maybe MRI scans and blood tests and whatever you can possibly imagine. What kind of research project would you want to do? I would really want to study the genetic um, markers or the genetic components of the main behavioral traits that make working dogs functional, right? The t and when I say working dogs, uh, it could be a broad thing, but dogs that search, dogs that do protection work, dogs that, you know, a, a variety of things like that. So dogs that are motivated dogs that are going to do complex behaviors um, in potentially stressful circumstances and things like that. And there's a suite of personality traits that are um, kind of incompatible with each other to some degree, right? So in protection disciplines, especially, I want this dog that it can be very aggressive, but also think clearly hmm. in that state of mind. A dog that um, I can get super aroused and I can kind of turn it off and on. A dog that can process information and take on new information in higher states of arousal. But I've noticed over the years that there are certain dogs that are still thinking as they ramp up in arousal. And there are other dogs where their brain basically stops functioning at a certain level of arousal and what's going on there. And the better working dogs are able to kind of hold it together, still take in information while still manifesting a lot of uh, a lot of motivation and a lot of arousal and excitement for the activities. And I would love to know if there are um, study different breeds and bloodlines or within breeds and if they're um, if the genetic traits are predictable through a package of genes and I'd also want to know what things we select for are incompatible with other things we're selecting for in a genetic package right the idea that if I select for super high levels of aggression there's going to be some like this dog I'll, I'll have some other uh, trait that won't go with that package. Or if I want a dog that's super stable, that's not reactive to anything in the environment, that's not bothered by things, can I still have that dog be very attentive and aware and a quick learner, etc.? I've noticed that there are personality types. The more stable a dog is, for instance, the duller they tend to seem, right? Mm -hmm. Some sweet spot where a dog is reactive or aware enough of their environment to pay attention to detail and so they learn quickly and they're responsive and processing in a way those are nice dogs to train if they're too reactive they go off the off the slide so how what are those things are are we able to get together and where are the trade-offs and is there would there be a, a genetic test where you could say like yeah this this dog's going to have those are most likely to have those traits and this dog's not i think that'd be super useful um, if, if we were to be able to find that and do this research, how would it change how you pick? Well, I guess it would change as in like you would pick the ones that really are suitable for the work that you are doing. But what are the other applications of this? I think for, for me personally, it probably wouldn't change a whole bunch um, in that uh, like me looking for my, the individual dog for me, um, I'm way more flexible and a wider range of dogs could suit that need for me because I'm my personal journey is connected to having those going there with different dogs. Mm -hmm. so if I got a dog that wasn't the ideal candidate. I might still 
spend time and mess with that. Where it would be really useful is in the disciplines where um, FEMA style disaster search dogs, um, military working dogs, law enforcement dogs, all those kinds of things where they're under time crunches to train and the economics of it is the big hurdle. Like they invest a lot of money in dogs, training time, feed, etc., in dogs that are not going to be functional for that thing. And you can't know until you're well into the process, right? And if there was a way of identifying that earlier, it would make a bunch of dogs have better lives. You'd be choosing candidates for those disciplines that are suitable earlier. So you wouldn't be trying to put the square peg in the round hole, which would be better for dogs. And it would be way better for those organizations in terms of finding suitable candidates and not wasting a whole bunch of money. Yeah. Dogs that are not, that are going to wash out, whether it's, and it could be for service dogs. It could be for all kinds of different aspects. I just uh, I came back from from a different conference about dog aggression, and one theme was pet dog and breeding for better temperaments, so it suits more pet owners. Um, with the caveat then that the looks, for example, might change significantly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's it. Like. That's if you could just get most people to stop getting dogs based on what they look like, right? And what they think they like, oh, I've always loved a husky. Uh, to me, that's the quintessential dog, right? <laughs> Fine if you have a lifestyle suitable to a husky or whatever it's going to be, right? <laughs> and so that if we could get people over that, and we haven't managed it in any other aspect of our lives. So I don't know why we expect to get it there. <laughs> 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 but but that would be great. That would be really excellent because they they are going to be different. They're going to look different. They're you know, that that's one of the biggest problems with temperaments in dogs in general is um, the focus on confirmation. Confirmation by itself, judging a dog by what it looks like by itself isn't inherently bad. The issue is that if you're trying, there's no such thing as a perfect dog. And so the physical characteristics, the external physical characteristics are the easiest ones to, to check. And so if you're, if that's on your radar, then you're much more likely to compromise on some aspect of temperament that you can't see or um, understand until you spend time with it and work with it and everything. Right. And so that evaluative process is much harder to do. And, and so there's all the show show world or the confirmation world is always making compromises on temperament because that's the thing you can't see. Right. And good breeders try to get it all, but you can't get it all in one dog. It's not, yeah. possible. it's hard enough to breed a dog with just great temperament or a dog to look a certain way those are those are all difficult by themselves and then when i ask for both of them i'm not likely to get both of them so where am i going to compromise on the stuff that i can't see right off the bat and that's a huge problem I'll give up what it looks like and try to pick the one that's got the temperament that's suitable and breeders now there are a whole host of breeders out there i have some good friends that are trying to breed the perfect pet dog now like that they've gone away from like, I'm not breeding dogs for their looks and I'm not breeding dogs for working disciplines. I'm breeding dogs to be good pets. Yeah. And, and people like ridicule those kinds of people all the time. Like, oh, you're ruining the breed. It doesn't look like a Labrador or it, you know, it's not going to win the field trial championships. But that's They're trying to make the perfect dog for that environment, which is exactly what everybody should be doing. Right? Well, so... You're saying that you don't care how a Belgian Malinois looks like as long as it has the temperament that you need. Yes. yes. Speaking of Belgian Malinois, mm -hmm. would you say this is your favorite breed to work with? Yeah, but by, by far. <laughs> My life is deeply intertwined with Belgian Malinois for a long time. What, what is it about Belgian Malinois? Um, gosh. So they have a, a unique combination of traits that suit kind of not the way I like to train and the things that I'm interested in doing in dog training, right? So one, the dogs um, bite like crazy. <laughs> and so it just so happens that I'm very interested in protection sport disciplines and they're, they really like to use their mouths in a way that is almost unique. Like they're, it's kind of, it, it's not natural in a way. Um, and they're, they're extremely athletic and what I realized is early on in my 
my exposure to protection dogs that you could find a lot of dogs that really bit a lot that had a lot of drive to bite that were very confident very strong dogs um but they were difficult to control and when you saw the best malinois they were crazy to bite and um incredibly athletic and then under amazing amounts of control right and what i noticed when i got my first malinois was they had a lot of motivation to work they were very intelligent um and they were kind of sensitive right so sensitive to the handler in a sense but you had a dog with that much motivation and that much commitment to biting and they were not sensitive to some degree then they're very difficult to control and it's a big headache and so they had this really lovely combination of traits but the sensitivity can manifest in bad ways when you don't know what they're about right like they're more high strung and more aware and more reactive than some of the other working type dogs are um but they suited me perfectly like the way i wanted to train the first malinois i got we were just like oh where have you been all my life like this is exactly Aww. the dog i like like they away from the work they're very affectionate physically affectionate with their handlers like they want to touch you and be on you and all that kind of stuff and out of drive um in lower states of arousal they're quite sensitive to the handler and things and so they're very responsive uh and so for me it was they are like the sky's the limit with them if you have a good malinois and you understand what makes them tick then i can do almost anything with those dogs and their desire to work and their ability to process information is remarkable that they're challenging though and if you kind of don't know how they work then they can go terribly wrong right so they lots of them carry a fair amount of aggression like i mentioned they notice stuff they're reactive and that sensitivity because people see how assertive they can be then it's easy to overdo it with the pressure point and then cause problems there right so there were big issues in law enforcement originally when a lot of the police canine units first started getting malinois in the US um which you know when they late 80s early 90s is when they started to catch on over here and now they're of course everywhere in law enforcement but they were kind of uncommon mostly german shepherds before that and lots of handlers getting bit by their own dogs right because they are less tolerant of stress when they don't know what to do without relationship they're more high strung and sensitive um and so they have some downsides if you don't get them but to me like i can't imagine having anything else and that right now for me they 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 feel easy like i just know what a malinois is like and how they think and so it's like oh yeah they're really easy to be live with <laughs> like i don't get it like they're always moving and they're always biting stuff and they're always like they're going all the time and i'm like yeah no, no, there it's it's <laughs> once you figure out how to work with it it's not bad <laughs> after the movie dog that was staring the belgian malinois after belgian malinois being in the news for finding prisoners and other hero stories we also have I think more than ever melts in shelters for that. Oh, so it's awful. It's the worst. Yeah. You know, like and I've had a front row seat to that whole thing. So when I first got into Malinois, you never saw a Malinois that wasn't with a working dog person and they never showed up in the shelters. And if one did, all everybody in town that had a Malinois said, "What? There's a Malinois on the shelter quick." Go to <laughs> now they're like now they're overflowing with them. Like lots of poorly bred dogs dogs that may even have had good bloodlines that people didn't know what they were getting into had a litter and was like oh my god get these things out of here it's bad and they're tricky in that the first year of their life is really important like this is true of a lot of dogs but especially a malinois who are a little bit obsessive compulsive and a little bit um edgy in general that if they don't learn where to put their energies when they're young and they start putting them in the wrong place they're very difficult to correct and they're a little OCD about things so once patterns are established they're much harder to break and so the, providing with the right sets of experiences early is really important uh, and so it's it's super frustrating and depressing a little bit right and the other thing is that they're i mean they're meant to to have aggression right and so it, it's a It's a complicated discussion in modern society but the dogs are bred to bite people they're bred to be police dogs right and so even though there are highly sociable malinois that 
are really friendly and they still like to bite and they would do sport bite work and things like that. You can also get mean ones in there at any given time, <laughs> you know, dogs that are like overtly antisocial. And, um, and a lot of people aren't, aren't ready for that. Yeah. They, they met a Malinois, they saw a Malinois and they're like, that one was really nice. Like just beneath the surface, there's aggression <laughs> and, and you don't know, you have to, when you Waiting enter, for you to come you out. You have to be willing to, to deal with that if you get it, right? Yeah. Has there, you've worked with a lot of mouths now over the years. Has there been, or is there right now one dog where you say that was, I will never forget this dog most beautiful almost maybe the most horrible dog i've ever had yeah. any any dog that you will never ever forget i have a number of them of course but st still the the one of the a female that i had named her name fotois so it's the mother grandmother great grandmother great great grandmother great great grandmother <laughs> great 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 grandmother to most of our dogs now uh she was a remarkable creature and she was one of those dogs that was not nice like uh so but it, in the work, just remarkable. Like she was an incredible dog and she was great for to live with it for if you had to prevent her from biting people. But aside from that, she was, she was lovely in the house. She like super easy to live with out of drive in drive. She was a maniac. Like she bit like crazy. She produced incredibly good working dogs. Um, but she was, yeah, she was a remarkable creature for sure. Loved that dog. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would love to have another crack at her now, knowing what I know now. Uh, you know, that's what that, that that's the thing you've had. You have dogs over the years, and you say, "Gosh, if I had that dog again now, what would you know? Yeah, what would I be able to do at that point." But she was a remarkable creature. But I've had a ton of really good dogs over the years that all leave a lasting impression. I've been lucky that way. So What's I've been breeding them for thirty years. So I've had, I don't know. I think I've we've well. 60 some litters or something like that. So, oh, wow. So I've had a, a lot of dogs through my life. <laughs> that is a lot of dogs. Like yeah. 600 dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, a whole batch. <laughs> well, you have uh, one puppy now, Snug. Snug, so, yes. Who gave yeah. the name? Uh, I did. So, my, well, actually, my wife Carol was like, I said I needed an S name. And so we just started tossing around S names. And, uh, Snug is a character in Midsummer Night's Dream in Shakespeare. He's Snug the Joiner, one of the, mm -hmm. the mechanicals that's doing the play within the play. And so I could be literary. I could say, oh, it's that Snug. Or I could just say, like, Snug is a bug in a rug. And I, I like, I choose, I choose a lot of names based on, like, how they sound, right? And I kind of like short names. Mm -hmm. Interesting sound. And I didn't know any other dogs named Snug. So when she brought it up, I'm like... I like that. I ran around saying it for a couple of days. Snug out. Oh yeah, that works. It sounds good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> like a trial. <laughs> yeah, like a trial. Period. Yeah. So it's that stuck. <laughs> Snug out. <laughs> That's how I track every day. Yell that over and over again. <laughs> um, hold on, snack. 13, 12 weeks. Thirteen. Thirteen weeks. Yeah. 13 yeah. Weeks. Thirteen weeks on Tuesday. Ah, oh, a baby. A baby. Yeah. 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 And Snug uh, obviously already started school, the Michael Ellis school. <laughs> they started right off the bat, yeah. <laughs> um, Which isn't always the case. I think it's important like, to realize that he was uh, a precocious puppy and he's really bold and he's very comfortable in a lot of places. And he, he has a really good food drive and a lot of play drive. And, and he's very connected, like mm -hmm. a lot like his great-grandfather, Pi. Um, it was as a puppy, like very easy to hold his attention and, and he, he liked training right off the bat. So a lot of times we bring home an eight week old puppy and you, I just, I don't try to do much with them. I just goof around a little bit and you know, you're housebreaking and you're crate training and you're showing them the world and you're kind of gauging all the reactions and things like that. Um, and you do a little training, you start messing around with stuff and some puppies just sort of demand that you do stuff. They're like, yeah, I got it. What? Come on, show me something else. Right. And, uh, and I let them dictate the pace. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I have puppies in the first four months of three or four months of life. I don't do much training, training. You're, you're training them all the time. They're learning stuff, but they're not 
super connected. The sessions have to be really short. You know, I don't ever want it to be a chore for them at this stage. I want it to be something that they're really bought into, and I don't like them kind of going through the motions. You want them invested in each of the repetitions, and so he supports it a lot. So I'm training quite a bit with him for his age, and he's got a fair number of skills. Heading in the right direction at this stage, but that's just because he he kind of wants it. Yeah, there's another puppy might not. You'd have to move more slowly. Well, Anya definitely did not support that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it, like, and I've had some really good dogs that just were like doofuses oh, well. for six months of their life for six months, which doesn't mean you weren't doing stuff, but it didn't. You weren't like he does more stuff than a, a lot of six month old puppies would do for sure. And that's just because that's that's just him. Okay. Yeah. If someone was to ask you, oh, yeah, it's a big question, but if someone was to ask you, what does it really mean to train your dog? How would you define training your dog? Ooh, that's a really good question. Because I mean, everything you're doing with them, especially with a new dog or a puppy, is is tr training. Um, so, setting up experiences to deepen your relationship and so that they learn uh, things that you want them to learn. And you're sort of kind of constructing how they view the world, how they view their interaction with you, how they view learning, um, and then how they view other stuff that's in the world, right? And, and so that's what, what training really is. And sometimes that's very much focused on behavior, like sitting and downing and coming and healing etc and then other times it's really it's more like an attitude in the dog and a connection with you right and to me the relationship part is first and foremost like that's the thing that's most important and if that feels good and i feel connected with the dog and the dog has the right attitude towards doing things then i may lean in kind of heavily to behaviors but it may not be too maybe it's just me hanging out with my dog Part of what I'm doing with him and I'm trying to do as much as possible is um, kind of document everything I'm doing with him the whole way, which will be part of a project I have where it'll be kind of dog training in real time. So you get to see that the actual formal training, the sessions are kind of not as frequent as people might think, and they're not as long as people might think. And then there's lots of just being out with your dog kind of putting them in certain situations so they learn things. There's lots of downtime. Uh, and especially with puppies, you'll hit a spot in your training where they're up to a certain spot and they're not old enough, mentally mature enough to move forward. And you don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So you just, you plant a seed and then you leave it for several months and you come back later. And then you plant a seed and you leave that one and you come back later. So there, that happens all the time. And, and so it's, um, and you're also trying to figure them out, right? Mm -hmm big part of it like I'm just trying to figure out what makes you tick what do you like and don't like and what do you notice in the world and all that you know training does sound like there's a start and an end point but there really isn't right so I'm um this is my definition of of training basically so you let me know what you think about this it's really coming from the neurobiological aspect of it but training is obviously learning mm -hmm. and learning is putting life into context uh, it's really it and I kind of um takes pressure off of the uh this has to be the one hour official training session and really again puts it into context and also as long as the dog is alive there's some learning happening so it kind of doesn't stop and i like that that kind of definition because you know if you say learning is putting life into context you can also relate a little bit more because this is how you learn yourself right uh, th that's a beautiful definition and much simpler than the rambling thing I just gave. <laughs> straight, straight to the point. No, that that's lovely. That's exactly right. And that, uh, that and that's uh, I think that's it. And you touched on it too. That I always say, and it, again, it's a bit of a cliche that the, the dog training thing is a journey. It's a process-driven discipline, right? You're moving in a direction, but it's the day-to-day -day interactions uh, that govern the success of it and you live very for a very short period of time at the end part of it you know like most of it is in process and like anything that any creature knows it's not once it's you're there it's not done like 
I say all the time, I'm like, I got an A in calculus in college. <laughs> like, you don't have to be freaking anything about calculus right now. <laughs> and there's none of it, right? So there's this idea that just because you learned something at some point or did something at some point, you know it. And it's that's not the case, right? It's it's all fluid, too. And so just the it's the day-to-day -day act interactions that's the whole thing. Yeah. And, and if you find value in that, then the getting to an endpoint doesn't seem so important right? yeah i agree with that. you'll wind up somewhere for sure but like without a focus on that yeah it's it's the pressure that, that comes with like you said at the beginning too right yeah like you get this dog for a certain reason and then all you can see is you know competing somewhere and being i don't know maybe world champion or just any kind of uh medal that whatever you want to win um but take or it doesn't have to even be in the sports world but it would be anything Mm -hmm. right focusing on the journey and making that as enjoyable as possible making a aggression rehabilitation journey enjoyable is really tough oh yeah no for sure <laughs> it <laughs> and, really is and it's an it's it's incredible how some of my students have found the way and they found little things where they reward themselves <laughs> and obviously right. they don't and seeing that as a journey rather than, okay, the aggression has to be fixed within the two months. And it makes a huge difference in what they actually end up achieving because they are getting somewhere. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, 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 it, and that's where you, you have to be focused on the kind of the little victories within there, the small things. And if you can keep that as your focus, the bigger picture uh, is much more likely to fall in. And most of the damaging stuff that's done is done on an arbitrary timeline. Right, it's one of the one of the current problems with with professional dog training in general. That out of necessity, people are putting these kind of arbitrary timelines on on training processes, a kind of one size fits all. Like I have a two week board and train, or a three week board and train, or a ten lesson package, or whatever that is. And people uh, without, unless trainers are very good about explaining that to people, that they're expecting to be done in a certain amount of time and that's just not how it works, <laughs> unfortunately. unfortunately <laughs> but the, but also the the whole process is fun. Like dog training is really cool and kind of amazing and fun. And so it, if you can get people to focus on that part of it, then the end part doesn't isn't doesn't feel so important. If you're out there having enjoying your time with your dog on a regular basis, then you know who cares ultimately uh, right. when. When you get to the end, right? If you're right. in day to day interactions, right? So, so when you have like, let's say, a more official, uh, formal training session, that'd be five minutes or 10 minutes with any of your dogs, for you to say, this was fun, this was a really good training session, what do you want to see in your dog? How do you want to feel yourself? Mm -hmm. And especially, in the context of emotional state of mind versus performance for that particular task that you were working on. Yeah, I'm super focused on the dog's energetics. Like how connected they are to me, how well they're staying on task versus how much they're wandering uh, and the intensity with which they kind of perform the behaviors that they're performing, right? Or intensity means it's not the right word the commitment there the, to with which they're performing the behaviors right and i mentioned in passing before that i'm really um interested in um fully committed repetitions in training where a dog feels very present really focused really invested and those reps are good solid reps that move things forward and then avoiding lots of I'm just doing this over and over again to do it right and yes my dog's doing it but it doesn't feel connected and it doesn't feel invested right and so I, I come across some training session I, I'll, I may have a training session that it didn't look like I did very much that I'm really happy with because I'm much more concerned with the dog's general energetics and concentration and desire to make the connections than I am, oh, I did 20 sits or uh, it, look, he's going to his place bed or like that kind of thing, right? And so um, I have 
sessions where I, you, you, it looks like, wow, you did a whole bunch of behaviors in that session. And then others where it didn't appear that I achieved very much externally, but it felt like the kind of session that I wanted to feel like. Mm -hmm. And if I start a session and I don't feel like that, I frequently just, I just end it and do something else all the time. Right. Routinely. And I let the dogs kind of ask for training a little bit especially with puppies, I'll take them out and I'm kind of prepared. I'll have food on me, I'll have toys stuffed in the back of my pants or whatever. And I'm just walking around the yard or whatever. And the puppy you know, is, comes up to bother me in some fashion or wants to bite my pant leg. And I'm like, oh, you want to do something. Let's, and I'll take advantage of those, those things instead of like, oh, it's time for my training session for today. Like mm -hmm. I got to work, let's go train. Like I, I'm very attentive to the dog's buy-in to that whole process. When I explain this to my students how, you know, a training session should feel like when I want them to also enjoy and have fun, um, I'm borrowing that from psychology to say you both want to be in a state of flow. You mm -hmm. everyone kind yeah. of can relate to it, right? Mm -hmm. it's like so lost in a task because it's just what you want to do and you're committed to it. Not just you as the handler, but the dog as yes. well. Yeah. That's a um, yeah flow state is exactly a perfect describe description of it right and when it's going right the, everything else just disappears too right there's no doubt about it it can feel very like there could be nobody around or a hundred people around and it doesn't feel any different you and the dog are just doing your thing and yeah. one thing sort of slows into another there's some experience that allows you to kind of steer that in the beginning I think a lot of people in the beginning are the if you describe that to them, they don't feel it yet. Like the difference between a dog that's looking at you and a dog that's looking at you, right? And as you gain experience, you start to really feel the differences. Like, okay, you're doing that, but your brain's elsewhere. You're, mm -hmm. you're even looking my direction, but with a lack of intent. And those kinds of little things start to stand out. And then your mechanical skills get better, which allows you to keep the session flowing in the beginning people's mechanics are not so good and so especially with puppies who you can't necessarily hold their attention for a really length of time so while you're bobbling around trying to get yourself organized and get set again or you're dropping food or other all the kind of stuff that happens that uh, there's some experience and some mechanical skills that help with the flow state like you know how to move and reload at the same time. And so everything just kind of seems to flow from one thing to another. And that's, that just takes some practice. But do you think everyone can learn it? Yeah, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Right. And like, obviously there's certain physical aspects of their choices of, of physical styles of interacting with the dogs, like certain types of play that not everybody is capable of doing. Somebody's going to have, you know, a bad back or, two blown out knees or like, so there, you may not be swinging dogs around in the air on tugs or like there, there, there are certain things that not, not everyone can do, but I think oh, the, that idea of a flow and like smooth kind of calculated knowing where you want to be and when you want to be there. Absolutely. You just have to want it. It'll be easier for some people than others, people that are in their body a little more, but yeah, I've had students that seemed hopeless that really wanted it. You see them, a year later and they're great they, they get it like yeah yeah you know it's it's basically also getting out of your own head you know i i i fall into this all the time it's like okay i'm because i'm testing things and i'm experimenting with her and then it's like okay you gotta get out of your head a little bit more and the dog also realizes that she's oh, like sure. you said right the males are so sensitive she mm -hmm. knows exactly when i'm trying too hard or yeah, but... when i'm like having a different agenda other than dancing the tango together right <laughs> yep, you're exactly right and you you have you're a very analytical person which then that that can get in your way sometimes like the idea that you're thinking like this should i should be doing this and I, this should be going like this right and sometimes you just have to pl play around the classic fuck around and find out right mm -hmm. you, like you you have to be willing to just mess with it some and it, it comes back around to that uh, that willingness to fail too like you don't find where the edges of those things are unless you push up against them. Right. And like if you're a smart person and you're doing your homework, 
you recognize there's a good way and a bad way to do things or a righter way and a wronger way <laughs> to do things. <laughs> and, and, and so, but that can cause you problems because you're then afraid to do things the wrong way. And there aren't that many mistakes that aren't, you're not, that you can't recover from, right? Especially in, in normal training stuff. And so like getting out of your head and not worrying too much about that and just kind of literally trying to feel it out is essential. Right? Yeah. You know, the other, the other thing that I, that I, that I think is so powerful about this, this being in this flow together with your dog is it is a known strategy in human psychology to rehabilitate anxiety because like you said right everything else blurs everything fades into the background and anxiety is the opposite right you get hyper dogs get hyper vigilant about their environment about everything else but you yeah to the point where they seek threats they see threats where they are you can be vigilant without being anxious mm -hmm. but with anxiety you kind of overreacting you see again you feel threatened when normally you you wouldn't as a dog speaking from a dog's perspective yeah of course yeah and if you be able to to apply this this interaction with your dog where the dog learns to you know fade out the background and learns that it's not threatening it's i think it's a very powerful tool to support the rehabilitation of anxiety or get certain dogs a little calmer agreed and and we have you know over medicated dogs because I do think we don't lean enough into the new biology of fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. We come and we have protocols of keep your dog as calm as possible, add medication. And keep, if it's an anxious dog, a vigilant dog, chances are this dog needs to move. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> channel that right. into you know this state of flow and this kind of interaction. One hundred percent. Yeah, like it's you're exactly correct. And I think that like the the flow, as it were, is um, like permission to tune the world out for a certain type of dog, right? And if they care enough about the interaction and you've done a good job of doing that, it's like they put on blinders. They're like, okay, that stuff all goes away. And over time, that's critical to staying in the environment long enough to actually change their mind about those things, right? For them to do it because your inability, if you don't have that connection with them, then you can't keep them around the triggers and things to help work on, on that yeah. type of Right. And that, that you touched on something in there as well, which is to me insanely important is this idea of, the, of controlling arousal all the time. Like in the behavioral science, there's a lot of like any arousal is bad arousal. If I have a reactive dog, then getting him excited is just throwing oil on the fire yeah. that were. But that's the only way to give them something meaningful. And anxiety creates energy for a lot of dogs. And if you don't give them some place to put it, it's got to go somewhere. Right. Like, and so anxiety creates energetics for a lot of dogs. They want to move and they want to do stuff and people will try having them in stable positions. Well, make your dog sit or down and that's like absolutely the worst thing you can do. Like yeah. something energetic for them to put their anxiety into <laughs> a, a functional thing is one of the rehab techniques for sure.